If you're looking for full-length MCAT practice tests, look no further than Next Step Test Prep. They have 10 full-length practice tests that simulate the real exam to help you get the best score possible. Use the promo code MSHQ to save 10% off your purchase. This is the pre-med year, session number 249. Hello and welcome to the three-time Academy Award-nominated podcast, The Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Well, last week, I was at Podcast Movement, where I was up for another Academy of Podcasters Award for Best Science and Medicine podcast. And for the third year in a row, I came up short. But that is okay. I had a blast. And I forget who won, but I'm sure they deserved it. Today, I have an amazing conversation with an amazing guest who is doing her very best to change the conversation around dying. She funded Extremis, a short documentary about end-of-life decisions being made in an intensive care unit, which was nominated for an Academy Award and others. Now she is pointing her efforts towards EndWell, a symposium to bring together all of the best minds in the world, not just in healthcare, but from the community, from the technology space. Anybody that wants to help change the end-of-life decisions and care that are going on in this world. That symposium is taking place December 7th, 2017 in San Francisco. The first one. There will be more, hopefully. Let's go ahead and jump in and have a discussion with Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter about her career and how it's taken a path to her dedication to palliative care and how you as a pre-med or a medical student can start to learn from what she is doing and from what others are doing and help you, no matter what field of medicine you are going into, help patients make their experiences being critically ill much, much better. Shoshana, welcome to the pre-med years. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. When did you realize that your life was going to be filled with treating patients and being a physician? Gosh, when did I realize that? I probably, well, for me, it was way after college. So I took somewhat of a a non-traditional route in that uh, my undergraduate studies ran the gamut from fine arts. I was a weaver for a while, a major in that. And then I loved women's studies. And then I loved, always loved Spanish. So thought I would be a Spanish major. And then I found a passion for marine conservation biology. So at the very end of college, thought I would be pursuing a a doctorate in in marine science and quickly realized that spending time living in a marine lab and doing experiments on little tiny limpets and crabs and was not going to be enough for me. I would walk into the lab every day and start talking to them. (laughs) And I said, well, gosh, these little guys are never going to be talking back. Is that going to be enough for me? And I realized, no, I really want to work with humans. Um, and, uh, found myself graduating from college, not really knowing what my next steps would be. And I, I found myself taking a job all the way across the country in North Carolina, where I had an opportunity to work at the medical center thinking, well, could, could medicine be a path for me? I've done some science in college, not all of the prereqs, but, um, about three months into that process of being a bit of an intern at Duke medical center, realized that I wanted to go to medical school. And so I, at 23, found myself back in college doing undergrad courses at UNC Chapel Hill. And then the following year, completed the the coursework and then took the MCAT. So it really wasn't until 25, age 25, that I thought, well, I've, I've done all the work. I've taken these exams. I've applied and somebody wants me. So there, there I was. At any point along that journey, did you question whether your age was going to be a factor and, and how long the medical school process is and residency and everything else that maybe you should just do something else because it was too late? 
At times I did, you know, at, at 23, I still, you know, I, I felt like I had many, many years to, to continue to think about the right professional course for me. I had, I was lucky to have some fantastic mentors that had come before me who had also taken time off uh, after college, before medical school. And for sure that, you know, that's changing now such that I think most people take, take some time off or take somewhat of a non-traditional route before uh, starting medical education. So it, it crossed my mind, but honestly, my biggest focus was where am I going to be happy and fulfilled in life? And that obviously won out for me. And despite the fact that I took about four years off between undergrad and, and med school, you know, I, I, I think that it, it was the right, the right path for me. I love that there's always that saying of, of when there's a concern about age, it's like, well, you're going to be 30 anyway. You might as well be 30 and a physician and 30 and not a physician if that's what you want to want to do with your life. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that the, that the best advice that I got at, at 23, 24, thinking about, gosh, am I going to really embark on this crazy long journey uh, um, that's going to be expensive, both, you know, financially, and emotionally. Um, and, you know, someone said to me, uh, which I totally still rings true for me, and that is, if there's anything else that you could see yourself really being happy and again, fulfilled in doing, do that, right? Don't, if you think that there, you know, you have a million interests and, and that medicine is just one of the many and it's, um, and it's not the end all be all for you. Like don't go into medicine because right, mm-hmm. because that, because that time commitment, um, the, of course the financial, um, component that's huge. So, and, and I, and I would never want to underplay that. I think that that is a, a, especially for women, right. Um, spending time, you know, potentially at a minimum seven years, if you complete residency, um, uh, in, in training, that's a lot of time, uh, of, of your life to give up. Um, not, it's absolutely, it's worth it, but, um, I think that people need to be as certain as possible that that's the, the right, uh, path for them before, um, jumping all in. Now, when you, you added that kind of caveat that, that as a woman part, are you talking just from, from a childbearing age and, and starting a family, having a family? Is that what you're talking about? That is what I'm talking about. I think for, for many people, that is something that, that they see as a part of their future lives, if it isn't already. And, um, and for women, especially, you know, the age, you know, 22 to maybe 32, um, for, for many people is kind of prime time to be thinking about, um, about children and, um, family, although, you know, that's not for everybody. And we, there are many, many, many ways to, um, to have families in this world and, and think about what's, you know, the, the right thing for you. So I, I just wanted to point that out for the people that, that are interested in, um, in, in that part of life. You mentioned that you had some mentors along the way to help, and everybody, I think, who is successful in life, and even those who aren't successful, will talk about mentors and helping guide you along the way. And a lot of students, I see the questions all the time, is how do I go about finding a mentor? How did you find your mentors, and how would you recommend somebody go and and find mentors for themselves? That's a great question and so, so important. Um, there are so many points in my life where mentors played such a big role. I think that, you know, for me, uh, it happened to be that I had family friends that, that happened to be in my life um, through other sort of random connections that, that, that turned out to be wonderful mentors for me as I was looking at uh, whether medical school was the right path, uh, applying thinking about where to go. And then, and then the next step being, you know, what do I do for residency? It just so happened that I sort of had people already built into my life that were there. I think, um, now I can imagine that with sort of the, the widespread use of social media and the acceptance of connecting with individuals via Twitter, via LinkedIn, you know, on the professional side, to me, it seems like, it, the it's it's wide open. I mean, there are so many people that you can connect with that you wouldn't otherwise have had access to just by you know sending them a thoughtful note on LinkedIn saying, "Hey, I'm a I'm a pre med or I'm I'm interested in medicine. I I'd love to 
get your thoughts about, you know, X, Y, Z, um, or just asking them a specific question and with the hopes that they'll, they'll see the message and write you back. I, I can't even tell you how many times, even now as a practicing physician, I've been able to connect with folks who I saw as, you know, complete role models or, or, you know, the, the, the people who I never thought I could, um, reach out to, um, just, just kind of, um, putting myself out there, uh, via, via a Twitter message or via LinkedIn. So, um, I think if there are specific people that, that folks want to connect with, if there's somebody who you think could be helpful, um, reach out to them. I like that you, you mentioned asking a specific question. I actually just tackled this on a, on a Facebook live stream right before we hit record on this interview of asking the right questions to the right people or, or asking the right questions in the right places. A lot of students are going through this process and they just ask very general questions. And so I picture a student reaching out to a physician saying, hey, I'm pre-med, can you help me? <laughs> and that's not a very helpful question. And the, the, the physician probably isn't going to either A, respond or B, respond helpfully, if that's a word. Um, but if you did some homework and, and so if they're reaching out to you and they see that that you're um, doing this end well project, which we'll talk about, and we're, we're nominated for an Academy Award and for an amazing uh, documentary and then they ask you a very specific question about getting involved in palliative care because that's what you're interested in, then that's a great question to ask you. And so students need to be able to do some research to ask good questions to potential mentors, potential people that they're reaching out to. Oh, absolutely. So yes. So I should preface that all by saying, you know, doctors and, and other professionals are incredibly busy. So if it, knowing, if you're writing this note to someone, you should know that they probably have 20 seconds or less to be reading the subject line, reading the first few sentences of the message, and they're going to decide if they even want to keep reading. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, be, be as thoughtful as you can and be as prepared as you can when reaching out to somebody and that you have researched them, what their background is. And, and, you know, in the first few sentences, you don't need to launch into your, you know, bi personal biography <laughs> to say, Hey, uh, I know you're busy. I, I just had a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a student or I'm, I'm thinking about this path and would love to ask you a question about, and, and be as directed as possible with that question. Um, something that they could easily just pop on their iPhone or pop on the computer and write you back and say, sure, let's, let's find a time to talk or no, I, I think, you know, you should look elsewhere or here's a resource for you. Um, but, but to be as thoughtful as you can, um, knowing that these folks are incredibly busy. Yeah. Busy, busy, busy. So you start, you're, you're a non-traditional student. You did your post back at UNC. As you applied to medical school, being a non-traditional student, what do you think was the hardest part for you as, as you went through that application process getting into medical school? Gosh, I don't think it was, the hardest part for me was just getting through all those forms. <laughs> and writing those essays. And I don't think that that's unique to a non-traditional student. I think everybody kind of dreads, uh, those secondary, uh, you know, requests for information. I don't think, uh, I, I don't think there's anything about being a non-traditional student that I felt, uh, like I, um, struggled with specifically there. I think actually it was a, it was more of an asset for me because in my interviews, I'd had some life experience and could talk about things that I had worked on, research I'd done after college and really give a clear sense of, of the time and effort that I'd put into making sure that medicine was the right path for me. And I, and I did all of that, you know, af after college. So if anything, um, it was a, it was a real benefit in the process. Did you enjoy medical school? I would say mostly not. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not a great test taker. And where I trained, we had major exams every two weeks. So for me, that was really hard. I, I studied um, pretty much all the waking hours of every day because I was so worried about those exams. One thing I did do, though, that really helped me, um, and I don't think this is for everybody, so I'm not going to recommend that that all uh, medical students um, you know, employ this tactic, but what, what I realized was that I found myself so focused on grades that it was 
just overwhelming. Um, and, and what I decided to do, which again was right for me, maybe not right for everybody, but I decided to stop checking my grades in medical school. What I realized was that I had already won by getting there. That was always my, you know, my ultimate goal was to get into medical school. And the fact that I had, I had made it and, um, I knew that I was going to be evaluated via, you know, the, these, these tests throughout the, the few years, the first few years of, um, of medical school when you're in the classroom. But for me, um, all I, I knew what was right was studying as hard as I could. So working hard, um, taking these tests, but being less focused on the actual grades. Cause I, I couldn't really do more than I was already doing. That's, I was just working very, very hard. So that, um, and then I would obviously, you know, tell my teachers like, listen, if I'm, I'm getting close to, you know, the, the gray area of here of not passing, which never happened, of course, um, let me know, but I'm, I'm going to work as hard as I can and, and that's going to be enough. Um, so that was one, one tactic that, uh, that helped me. And then in the clinical years, in the third and fourth year for me, I loved getting to take care of patients. I think that the, the second two years of, of training, uh, were, were much better much better for me. I was more, uh, well-suited just, just being in the hospital and not so focused on the classroom. Um, so yeah, medical school is hard. Um, anyone who tells you otherwise is either a complete genius <laughs> or, or lying to you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I had the same exact experience. Those last two years were so much better because there was more context around what you were trying to learn and everything else. So I think as you, knowing that you were a bad test taker, knowing that medical school wasn't fun for you, looking back at the, the way that you evaluated medical schools and how you chose what schools to apply to and ultimately where you went to, where you went to school, how would you go about doing that differently? Because a lot of students are bad test takers. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it's interesting now. It seems to me that over the last maybe just handful of years, a lot of medical schools are radically changing their curricula or the way that at least that um, information is taught to either fewer years in the class or fewer months in the classroom, building in a research year, potentially um, making uh, the classroom material more case based. So it's actually, you know, built, the context is built into what you're learning. Um, so I would say, and obviously now with, you know, websites being um, so readily available for all institutions, it's much easier to research, you know, which schools are doing what kind of, um, of, of changes around that. And so I would have absolutely, for me, looked at, at places that were maybe had fewer months in the classroom and had more hands-on time either with research or with getting a, a master's degree during medical school or spending more time uh, on the ward taking care of patients. That would have been a, a better fit for me. That said, I even know, you know the institution where I trained has in the last five years radically changed how they, they're approaching the undergraduate medical education the first two years in the classroom. Um, so I, uh, I would say there's definitely a lot of um, variation still out there. And it just takes kind of some digging, um, as to which, which schools are, you know, have the right setup, um, depending on what you're looking for. If you could craft the perfect medical school, perfect curriculum for a mm -hmm. school based on what you feel are the, the needs of patients today and the way the U S healthcare is today, we'll, we'll stick to us. What do you think is is the biggest need for schools to switch to or change in their in their system? I definitely think that more case case based learning um, is helpful, and it um, it really allows for students to remember material better because it's actually um, taught in the setting of an actual um, patient, either patient encounter or a story. Um, that for me would have been, been huge. I feel like there's so much of medical school that I never use or have to think about. So it almost seemed like I look back and it was a waste of time to tell you the truth. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, I, I also feel very, very strongly that medical schools need to teach a little bit on healthcare economics. I finished, uh, training really with even residency training with very little understanding of 
our healthcare system. Everybody talks about how broken it is. It's on the news every day. It's, <laughs> it's a huge issue. And as a physician, you should be able to at least very, very high level talk about that and think about it critically. And, and unless you, you know, have, have studied that in your undergraduate years or are, you know, a, a, an avid reader of kind of what, what's happening, it's, it's pretty hard to fully understand that it's, we have such a convoluted multifaceted, you know, problem, um, of, of healthcare that it would have been very helpful, um, to have some formal training in how to think about that. I would also say, you know, there are many opportunities outside of, um, of, of just, you know, a clinical position taking care of patients for entrepreneurship in medicine. And that's also something that isn't taught probably outside of schools like Stanford. Um, so I think that, um, adding some components around healthcare economics, um, and entrepreneurship, uh, in medicine could be, um, really helpful to, to kind of, um, make sure that doctors, uh, are more involved in these conversations on a national level, on a policy level in, in industry. Um, th those are two areas that I'm finding myself very interested in now and, and really going back and learning on my own. So you, you've you gone through the process, non-traditional student, all the experiences you had before. You're a hospitalist now, but I consider you a palliative care physician because of your passions and your interest in palliative care in, in the world, um, in medicine, but and specifically in medical education. Why is palliative care such a big part of your life? Actually, before yep. before you answer yeah. that, explain what palliative medicine is. Ah, yes. So palliative medicine is a fairly new um, medical subspecialty that focuses on quality of life for anyone um, facing serious illness. And it can be used at any time during the course of that illness. So palliative care is fantastic in that it employs a a team-based approach to caring for people. So typical palliative care teams have a, a nurse, a social worker, maybe a chaplain, a, a physician as well, and then sometimes some other um, folks on the team who, who all work together in a, in a much more interdisciplinary fashion than you might typically find um, in, a, in a healthcare setting to talk about um, what matters most to patients who are facing life-limiting illness. And again, to, to make sure that that they're focused on on quality of life for as long as they have left. Um, so it's it's a field that, uh, as I said, is is fairly new, and uh, was born out of a need to kind of bring the humanity back to medicine because there actually is a place for us in medicine to to care for people when cure isn't always an option. Why? So uh, before I ask that next question, why do a lot of people, the, the, especially students coming up and, and physicians in, in practice now, there's always, there seems to be resistance to palliative medicine mm -hmm. because the theory is I'm a physician. The Hippocratic Oath says, even though it doesn't, <laughs> says do no harm. Um, and, and so palliative care is, in their minds, giving up and doing harm. How do you, why is that? And how do you fight that? I think there are many reasons uh, for that. I think, I definitely think it's changing. So I think, it, you know, in the last five or so years, palliative care has been much more widely accepted nationally. Something like 90% of major hospitals in this country have palliative care available for patients. So things are changing, but we have a long way to go. And I think that, uh, like what I was taught, is that death is a treatment failure. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to talk about failure, right? No, nobody wants to think about that. Our job as physicians, at least as, as I was taught, is to is to cure people of their disease and then great, you've, you've, uh, you've made it. Um, I, as I said, you know, there are times when cure isn't an option as much as we would love to see everybody, um, well and back to their, you know, uh, baseline level of, of, of health. It's not always possible. And so there are times when we need to, 
um, transition our focus on to maybe a comfort based approach. If people are having trouble with, with pain or other symptoms, or it's really, um, shifting our focus to quality of life, as I said. So for some people, um, if we know that, um, treatment is no longer working, um, that there are, um, other ways to support patients and families, um, through serious illness. Um, and that can be many things. Sometimes it's spiritual care. Sometimes it's, um, treatment for depression related to their illness. And sometimes it's pain control or other symptom management. Um, that's not to say that palliative care is only for people who, uh, for whom cure isn't an option. It's really, really for anybody um, who's been diagnosed with a serious illness. But we tend to focus a lot on folks who have a who have a terminal um, diagnosis. So um, I think that um, in this country, you know, we are so technologically advanced, and our ICUs save lives every single day. And we have this amazing miracle of, of modern technology. Um, and we think I, I think I think that we. Uh, approach um, every patient thinking that we should do everything for everyone. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, I, I can't even tell you uh, how many, you know, often frail elderly patients who have, you know, 10 chronic medical problems on top of end stage liver disease or heart disease or maybe um, advanced cancer um, for whom ICU and aggressive care is not going to help them. It's going to prolong their suffering. And, and that's how I sort of got found myself interested in palliative care because I was taking care of so many of those patients that I was distressed by it. Once I realized, Oh my goodness, nothing I'm doing for this person is actually going to help them. So when we start talking about the Hippocratic oath, the first do no harm, I think that's right. Um, I, I felt like I was harming people in their last maybe moments or days of life. Um, when we could have been focusing on things that mattered to them, like being pain free or being with family, um, or maybe eating and drinking instead of having a tube down their mouth. So, um, I think that, uh, as I said, I think things are changing around acceptance of, of palliative care and, um, we, we absolutely have a long way to go though. How do you differentiate between palliative care and hospice? I think a lot of mm -hmm. students and even physicians still confuse the two. Yeah, so hospice is a part of palliative care. So as I said, you know, palliative care is this long continuum when it's when it's when it's used uh, at its at its best, it's this long continuum of time from from the time of the diagnosis of a serious illness all the way through until, you know, the end of life. So death and dying and, and, and actually after with grief and bereavement. So palliative care can, can be used for like years and years. Hospice um, is somewhat arbitrarily uh, relegated to the last six months of life. And, and that's a sort of a Medicare reimbursement designation such that patients have to be, quote, reasonably within the last six months of their life in order to be eligible for hospice uh, services. So, um, you know, it's, it's that in thinking about the whole continuum of time of palliative care, hospice is just that last, you know, six months to year of time. The majority of students listening to this are going to be pre-meds on their journey. What can students be doing now to, A, learn about palliative medicine, palliative care outside of this podcast, and B, what can they start doing to, to start making an impact, not only now, but in the future as they're going through medical school and advocating for more education of palliative care in medical school? In order to learn more about palliative care, I would say there are uh, a few, well, there's several great resources. Um, the team out of New York has a fantastic website that's much more public, you know, patient facing called Get Palliative. Uh, I believe it's getpalliative.org that has a lot of videos and information um, really geared towards a general audience talking about what palliative care is and how it can best support people. And we have a lecture series um, at ungerlighterfund.org where we, you know, host uh, um, 
experts in palliative care to come in on a quarterly basis and talk about various components. Um, I think, I think just understanding, um, as you know, maybe for people who have had a little clinical experience taking care of patients or maybe who have not, um, that palliative care, um, is, is really works the best when patients get an early referral, um, meaning that, gosh, you've been diagnosed with a, with a late stage cancer, um, or pretty advanced heart disease, um, or liver failure. Um, there's a team that actually can work alongside the primary medical team to offer an extra layer of support for patients and families. So to me, it's like this no brainer of who wouldn't want an extra layer of support, um, from a team who says to me, how can I make your life better? You know, um, so that, and that's really what palliative care is all about. It's not, it's not about saying that, you know, you're, you're, you're dying. It's not about saying, um, we're going to take things away from you. If anything, it's much more about, um, making sure that you are living well, um, for as long as you have left on this earth. An extra team to help a person's life, a patient's life sounds expensive. And in our healthcare world that we have today, especially in the U.S., it all comes down to dollars. How do you, how have you fought the insurance side of things when you're saying we need this whole extra team to help uh, this newly diagnosed patient? Well, I, I have to say I'm I'm definitely not an expert on on payer reimbursement. Um, I think that's one area that I'd actually love to uh, to dive more deeply into. Um, often when, when patients are in the hospital, um, and, and a palliative care team is, is called in to, to consult or to see a patient and their family, you know, that is covered. So that's covered by insurance. Um, I, as far as thinking about, you know, on the outpatient side, meaning in the clinic, if a patient is able to, to, you know, drive over to their doctor to see someone, um, that that's a slightly different, um, insurance reimbursement setup. But most insurance companies uh, are recognizing that palliative care offers a huge value for patients, not only financially, but you know it's it's just good care, um, and are and are reimbursing that. And obviously, that needs to be thought about on a case by case basis. But I definitely think that um, things are changing around uh, around payers um, being much more willing to cover these services, even alongside curative treatment. So people can be undergoing chemotherapy or other, um, other expensive treatments and, and still benefit from palliative care. You funded an award nominated documentary all about end of life care. And now you're putting on a conference all about end of life care called end well, (laughs) talk about end well and, for students that can make the trip to the San Francisco area, talk about what to expect if they can get there. Ah, yes. So I, you know, find myself going to all sorts of palliative care and serious illness policy conferences around the country and have loved getting to know the amazing people who operate in this space, who have been doing wonderful work for many, many years. Um, one thing that I have found um, surprising is that it's always the same people. When I when I go to these uh, when I go to these gatherings, these conferences, it's the same same core team. Um, and I'd like to invite new people to this conversation, folks outside of the realm of palliative care, maybe other specialties in medicine, maybe um, more folks from from nursing or social work or even the spiritual care uh, realm. To, to get more involved in these high level conversations. Um, and actually I'd even go as far to say as saying, you know, this is, this is actually not a healthcare issue. This is a human issue, right? How we live, um, and hopefully live well until the very end is something that applies to all of us. And so I founded, um, the first of its kind gathering called end well taking place in December December 7th of this year in San Francisco to really bring together the worlds of design of technology being that we're in the Bay area of healthcare, of policy, of media, law, uh, patient advocacy, all with the goal of generating very interprofessional 
human-centered innovation for the end-of-life experience. And so that's intentionally broad. We're looking at how can we redesign systems? How can we come up with new products, new services that really transform the end-of-life experience into a much more human-centered experience? So this is going to look and feel a lot like a TED event. We're not TED, obviously, but we're going to have 20 world-renowned thought leaders speaking in a full day of, you know, really engaging, very short, highly curated presentations. And 400 attendees are coming uh, from all over the world. Um, folks, as I said, that kind of mirror the, the diversity of our, of our speakers from, from various um, backgrounds. And it's open to the public. Um, we are, would love to have more uh, medical students or people who are thinking about going into medicine attend. Um, really anyone that, that cares about, uh, this issue, um, as, as really a human issue. So it's more information at endwellproject.org. And we hope to see you in December. If you could paint the perfect path for, for medical students and residents going through how early and how often would palliative care be part of the curriculum? I would, thinking back to my first few years in the classroom of medical school, I think that even there, there would have been a place for more um, pharmacology, a uh, better understanding of some of the medications that we use around um, palliative care, which are often um, uh, opiate pain medications, other medications that focus on symptom relief from shortness of breath, um, and other things that are affecting folks who have, you know, um, very, uh, severe illness. So I think very, very early on, I think for sure in the third and fourth years, when I was spending time on the wards, getting to have a rotation with a palliative care physician would have completely changed my outlook. I think on how I cared for, you know, all the patients that I was seeing, um, it really just would have given me uh, a much, a much better foundation, um, to think about, you know, how can I best take care of patients? Um, and then for me, it wasn't until my first year of residency in internal medicine that I had any exposure to palliative care. And that was my, you know, many months in the ICU, as I said, taking care of very, very sick, often very uh, frail and elderly patients who were not benefiting in any way from what we were doing in the ICU, despite the fact that, of course, uh, that's our default, that's the default, um, sort of path for patients in this country. If, if you're sick and, and you need help, no matter how old you are and no matter how sick you are, you'll receive aggressive invasive care, even if it's not going to help you. So there in my mind, you know, there was that disconnect early on and I, it wasn't until, you know, getting back to this mentor thing, um, until I had a mentor in palliative care, um, as a, as a resident that I realized just how amazing it is when you can sit down and have a human to human conversation with patients and families about, well, here's the prognosis right now. Here's what I'm concerned about for the future for you. Tell me about, you know, asking the patient, tell me about what matters most to you in your life um, and how we can um, and best help you spend the time that you have left, um, you know, full of, full of meaning. Um, so when I, when I got exposed to that, it just blew my mind. I realized just how much that can help patients just as much as a heart cath and just as much as any procedure that we do in medicine can help a conversation, um, like that related to goals and values for patients can, can be life-changing. I think students who are interested in emergency medicine should listen to this a couple times, this, this whole mm -hmm. interview. I have a very close friend who's an emergency medicine physician, and she wins awards for for helping people die because when people come in to the emergency room, she is very much the one that will say, "Wait a minute, you're you have stage four cancer. You've had it for a, a long time. You are dying. Let's talk about not sending you to the ICU and what else we can do 
to make your life better. And so she, her hospital has recognized that she helps these patients with their care, with their life through palliative medicine as an ER doc. And I, I think that's a huge point of entry for palliative medicine. If we can get the, the emergency medicine docs to start having this conversation. Oh, absolutely. I can't even tell you. I mean, that the majority of our patients that come into the hospital, so I work as a hospitalist, you know, are through the ER and they, they end up on a certain trajectory of care because the ER doc kind of sends either decides, you know, this seems like an ICU uh, admission or, or not. And so absolutely emergency medicine and others on the front lines too, like primary care. So as, as busy and as um, sort of tapped out on time as, as the as the primary docs are, it's so hugely helpful um, when they've even just taken a few minutes to sit down with their patients who maybe they've known for years to talk about issues related to maybe even advanced care planning, meaning, you know, um, what are your wishes if you are to become sicker? Um, And again, it gets back to these questions, these core questions of, um, you know, who are you as a person? What are your goals and your values for living your life? What is meaningful to you in your life? And have you shared that with your family? Because you can go, you can write all these documents up and have them in the electronic record and they're all, you know, legally set up. But if you haven't talked to family about what your wishes are, that's where the really, the big trouble comes in. And so really encouraging patients, you know, if if it is an upstream conversation like that before people are acutely ill, um, encouraging them to talk with family. So absolutely, um, we all have a part in this. Oncologists as well, um, cardiologists, kidney docs, nephrologists, um, you know, anyone who, who takes care of patients, um, it's, it's all of our jobs to be engaging in these kinds of conversations. So for the student that is on their journey, maybe hasn't found exactly what they're looking for at this point, like, like you didn't find medicine for a long time, what would you say to to that student who's still early on to let them know that this journey is worth it, even though you didn't enjoy those first couple of years of medical school? What, what do you say to let them know that at the end of the day, even with all the headaches that are out there in healthcare, even though there are physicians that say, don't go into it, you seem to have found your passion, your love. Mm-hmm how do you, how do you transfer that to those that are following in our footsteps? Well, I would say first and foremost, it will get better. So just, you know, push through if you can. Um, you know, once, once you're done with medical school, that's a, that's like the biggest hurdle. I think that was the hardest thing. Residency, while it's much more time consuming, it's much more fun because if you want to take care of patients, that's where you get to do it and really learn. Um, and then after residency, you know, the world is, is wide open. There are so many paths. And I think for people who don't yet know whether they're, you know, in medical school now or thinking about going in, they don't know what they want to do. The right path will present itself. I think I was one of those people. I wasn't really sure, you know, what I wanted. And, and when after my, you know, eight or 10 weeks of internal medicine, my third year that I was sold, that was for me. And I never thought that would have been my path. And so just being open to, you know, those, those opportunities and experiences. And then I think, and, and, and that's not to say that clinical medicine is for everybody. I think that if you find yourself not so interested in taking care of patients, um, but you're in the middle of medical school, there are a million other routes you can go with your medical degree. So there are are industries that are all over the place looking for physicians to, to consult the pharmaceutical industry, um, all of biotech, plenty of entrepreneur, uh, positions out there, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, people looking for physicians who are, are trained, but maybe not even have done residency. So there's, there are many, many options. So don't get discouraged. If you feel like a, a, a career in clinical medicine isn't for you, um, there's always a path forward. All right, there you have it again. That was Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Go check out the Endwell Symposium at endwellproject.org. Again, December 17th, 2017 in San Fran, Cisco. If you're interested in Shoshana, you can go listen to her specialty stories interview where she talked about being a hospitalist. That was episode seven of the specialty stories podcast. As I mentioned at the very beginning, go check out Next Step Test Prep. Use the promo code MSHQ on any of their products and services, but they are specifically 
one of the best places to get MCAT full-length practice exams. So if that's something that you're getting ready for, you can buy different size packages all the way up to 10 full-length exams. Go check them out, nextsteptestprep.com. I hope this was useful for you and you got something out of it. No matter what field of medicine you are interested in going to, palliative care, palliative medicine can be a big part of that, helping patients with their end-of-life decisions and care to make the best of their life, whatever they decide that means. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here at the Pre-Med Years. (laughs) 